I thought, hey, they can't be the only ones who have ever, uh, you know, ripped off somebody else's album cover. <laughs> Hey, welcome to a Thursday Collection Connection, where we're playing that game. It's just an excuse to talk about records. Play the game with my brother, Plastic Eric, from the Plastic Soundwave Cult. And you can play along, follow along, by subscribing to both channels. So in Eric's last video, he talked about uh, Gorillaz, Demon Days. It's the first album in uh, quite some time that I've actually uh, already owned <clears throat> that he's played. Uh, and yet I'm still kind of unfamiliar with it. Uh, I was uh, certainly familiar with Damon Al Albarn and I have uh, a few Blur albums, but it was mostly uh, my kids gravitating towards some Gorillaz tunes uh, that made me finally kind of check them out. I certainly wear them. I knew some of the singles, but uh, even in buying it, um, I, ne I didn't, didn't really ever give it a thorough going over. I just kind of heard the songs that my kids would play in the car. And so, so it was interesting, um, to finally get a couple spins. I listened to it through a couple of times. Uh, not bad, a kind of a sleepier blur, <laughs> which was pretty sleepy to begin with quite often. As far as a connection, I rejected uh, Big Audio Dynamite's first album, This Is Big Audio Dynamite, um, which has a song on it called Sudden Impact, which uh, is the title of one of the Dirty Harry films, uh, the first one being Dirty Harry, and that being a song on the Gorillaz album. And I also was really tempted to talk about uh, Parquet Court's uh, Wide Awake album, which was produced by Brian Burton, better known as Danger Mouse professionally. And he also produced the Gorillaz record. And in the end, I found a hybrid uh, that kind of borrows from both of these and expands on both of these uh, for layers of connections, rich in connection. Danger Mouse, Brian Burton, not sure which to call him, uh, produced the uh, Gorillaz album. It was kind of his big uh, commercial break. And he had produced the, the Grey album, which uh, blended uh, the Beatles' White album and Jay-Z's Black album to create uh, something new, but it was something he could never release because he was never going to have <laughs> the license uh, to release it commercially, but that sort of put his name out there, uh, gave him some notoriety, and the forward-looking Damon Albarn said, hey, I want you to produce my record. So it was very early in his uh, producing career. Uh, he's gone on to a great career. He's won uh, several Grammys. Uh, I think he produced Adele's uh, 25 album. I forget all the number names of her records, but... Uh, and that one, I believe, album of the year. And so, yeah, he's been flying high. He has a uh, propensity to uh, team up with people. Uh, he uh, teamed up with uh, MF Doom for a collaboration. He, the rapper, he teamed up with uh, CeeLo Green, uh, of course, for Gnarls Barkley, had a big hit with uh, Crazy. And uh, they put out a couple of albums, and he also... Uh, teamed up with James Mercer for uh, James Mercer of the Shins for the project Broken Bells. So he's one of the layers, uh, but while he produced Gorillaz, uh, he also produced and was in the band, so he had an expanded role in Broken Bells. Now, the Clint Eastwood connection, uh, Clint Eastwood, of course, starred in Dirty Harry, well, later on, uh, he appeared in, he acted in, and also directed for an expanded role, a movie called A Perfect World. And my album opens with a song called Perfect World. So not a hundred percent match. We lose the article, but uh, kind of a match there. And then interestingly, 
Uh, Gorillas, of course, was uh, kind of a side project offshoot uh, of Damon Albarn of Blur that was much more commercially successful than in the U.S., I should really denote because, of course, Blur was huge in, in England, but in the States, uh, Gorillaz was much more commercially successful than Blur was. And also in the U.S., uh, James Mercer's band The Shins, uh, while Critical Darlings, uh, never been big sellers, and his side project with Brian Burton, Broken Bells, is uh, much more commercially successful than uh, anything The Shins have done. So, with all these connections, I am connecting uh, Gorilla's Demon Days to Broken Bell's 2014 album, their second album, After the Disco. This one didn't get quite as much attention as the first album, The High Road, was kind of a big single from uh, their first collaboration. And I was surprised that they did a second one. But uh, personally, I love this record. Um, how it synthesizes sort of uh, the sounds of the 70s in a weird way. And I, maybe it's just the title after the disco that puts me in mind of the 70s, but there are songs that feel like they recall uh, ELO and the Eagles and the Jackson 5 uh, in bizarre ways that uh, I'm not even a huge fan of some of those <laughs> acts. And yet... Uh, I find it very compelling. The Bee Gees is another one for sure, uh, with Holding On To Life, kind of doing that falsetto. But I love this record. I love The Perfect World, which opens up the record. I think it really sets the scene and brings me into the record in a great way. Leave Me Alone is a favorite, or Leave It Alone, I should say, not Leave Me Alone. The Changing Lights is the one um, that makes me think of Jackson 5, or the Can You Feel It specifically, it makes me think of. I think Control was the one that makes me think of the Eagles. But uh, yeah, it, I I adore this album. I like it better than the, than the first album, so it doesn't get quite as much love. It's almost as commercially successful uh, as far as charting position as the first album. Um, but kind of a blip, I think, in the consciousness of the world. I still listen to it regularly. Uh, I put it in my top 50 albums when I compiled them uh, in 2014, and I would still, I think, put it on there. Uh, so that's quite something for an album to make it on your top 50 in the year of release. And uh, so I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, I don't know that it's universally beloved, but uh, I really like the record. And unknown to me, when I chose this uh, album to do, doing my research, I come to find, I was completely unaware of, about uh, 10 days from now, they are on the cusp of putting out their third record uh, called, I think, Into the Blue. Into the Blue, I think. Um, but yeah, they put out a couple of singles this year. They've had a couple of non-album, uh, an EP, and a couple of singles that they've put out uh, over the years, just sort of digitally. Um, but yeah, they are, they've been putting out a few songs this year, and that is leading up to uh, an October 7th release of their third album. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I'll be looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully they can uh, keep on keeping on, and even with the eight-year gap, uh, it hasn't felt like an eight-year gap to me because, like I say, I listen to this one regularly, the first one less regularly, but it's still in rotation. It had some great tracks on it too. Uh, but this duo of Danger Mouse and James Mercer, Broken Bells, uh, I will pass that on to Eric with, with a bonus challenge. Uh, what did Broken Bells have in common with Iron Maiden? What connects Broken Bells and Iron Maiden? If you can think of it, feel free to use it as your connection. And so, yeah, I will throw that over to Eric and you can look for his response on Monday. 
on the Plastic Sound Wave Cult. So that's my piece. I thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you.